what player you're using and so on. Get started here. Okay. Okay, that's great. They'll, they'll be terrific. Good. Okay, so um, folks, we're going to be talking now about uh, capturing agent behavior initially in isolation using the com most common mechanism, both in any logic and more broadly in agent-based modeling for describing agent uh, evolution. And that is the state curve, sort of as a unifying sort of mechanism that, that is a, a very uh, predominant one. It's not the only. We'll, we'll see ways you can describe it with stocks and flows. We'll see, make some reference to ways that you can have agents updated using sort of discrete rules, chunk by chunk by chunk, according to having their variables evolve. But this is one of the most powerful, one of the most intuitive ways of describing it. So um, I'd like to continue on the model that we've we've built here and what we're going to do is we're going to build on some of the principles that we just talked about and uh, introduce some mechanisms and we're also going to introduce state charts and we're going to illustrate the semantics, the meaning of state charts by building up a little model which makes use of them. Okay? Um, so um, I'd like you to go to the person class associated with that model. And I would like you to go add in a variable from the palette called plain variable. So again, we're going to be modifying person. So we've got to make sure person is open here. And um, then we're going to have a variable here. In older versions of any logic, I think it was called plain variable. Here we're going we're to just call it variable. And I'm going to name it color, and it's going to have a lowercase c. I had this count children thing, which I added in to, to illustrate something, but I'm just going to get rid of that, and, and there's color here. Okay? Now, it's going to be different than some of the things we've seen thus far, because it's not a so-called built-in type. Now, these types, you could think of kind of types as delineating the set of things that a variable can hold. Double, it can hold real values. Values you know, that, that they're expressed with the decimal points and so on. If it's an integer, it can hold integer values. Here, it's not going to be a Boolean, it's not going to be an integer, it's not going to be a double, it's not going to be a string, it's going to be a what they call a color. Okay? <laughs> it's going to be a color. It's going to be the color on the screen that's going to be associated with this, okay? So so we're going to do. Why is it available under the parameters, but not under the variable? If you put that parameter, it's one of the types. You mean color? Yeah. I, I think that's that. Uh, that is uh, not by design. <laughs> I, I think I think that's an accident. I mean, fundamentally, it's a convenience, so it doesn't really impede things. But um, I think what you're saying is that's one of the default choices you have for, uh, for a parameter, but not for variable. And I suspect it was a bit of sloppiness in that part. I think they probably would have wanted it to be consistent. I wouldn't be surprised if in a future version of any logic they, they make it one of the choices for variable. There's no deep reason, I don't think. Um, so we're going to call it a color. Now, you'll notice that I, I do capital C, okay? Capital C for color. The actual variable is called lowercase c. And this is by convention in Java. We have our variables typically named with lowercase letters. And this applies for, for parameters too. It's a convention we use so that if we see a name, we kind of know what sort of thing it is. If it's a lowercase name, it's, it's probably the name not of a class, not, but of, a, of an instance, of a, a variable that, that may hold a reference to something or hold a number or what have you. This is a lowercase, and this is a, a capital. So this color here, that, that's going to describe some, um, some color and its visual representation, OK? Um, and uh, if you want to know where that came from, that's uh, if, we, if we sort of typed it out, um, 
and we do CL, COL, um, and, uh, and you'll notice it's, it's in something called, so these, this refers to what package it lives in, sort of where it's defined. This is actually not defined by any logic. It's defined by Java more generally as a language. It defines this thing called color. Um, and we're going to make use of that. It's not, it's not something built into any logic. It's something outside of that. Okay, so this is going to denote a variable, this agent's color when it comes to their existence. Okay, um, so we've just added that in, and we're going to give it an initial value, black, capital with a capital B L A C. Okay, black. Okay, so it's going to have color black initially. Is a variable? It has to have some initial value. Maybe it's going to change after that, but that's its initial value. Well, it's a good question. Um, in earlier versions of Java, it had to be. I think nowadays, if you go and you look at what options are available, um, you can see actually there's now a lowercase and an uppercase. But it has to be it has to be consistent. Um, that's just the way the the folks who built Java. They named it that way, um, and and if you want to go see the the palette, the, the well, the, the set of choices you can do color dot, and that's actually saying, hey, color, tell me all the things within you, and and uh, <laughs> that's how I speak to my computer, um, <laughs> and uh, and it it'll it'll tell you various uh, various types of things here. That's actually not all of them. They're they're located in alphabetical order, and we can in fact scroll down. We will see a profusion of different colors: magenta and orange, and pink and green and yellow, and and uh, various other other colors, cyan. Um, but we're going to make it black, and and we can make it capital B, or uh, or we can make it all lowercase. But um, did a little bit of sleight of hand here. I, I actually said color dot black. That means the black as defined by color. Okay, and maybe that's better than just saying black because black you don't know where it's coming from. Um, you know, maybe it refers to um, black from some other source. You, color dot black is actually more specific. It means the black as defined by color. Mm -hmm. By the color class, the class that defines colorness. Okay. Um, Okay, so so we have a, a color here. I'm gonna do this. Okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna make the oval. So upon our screen, upon our our um, object here, we will see a uh, an oval, and um, we're going to give it uh, a property based on that color. In fact, we're gonna we're gonna use that as its fill color. Okay, um, so um, I'll, I'll pull it up. You notice we're gonna have fill color be color. Okay, make sure you select the dynamic tab. All of this is going on in what class? Sanity check, folks. Where in our model? What are we modifying right now? We're modifying person because we're dealing with the the the, the appearance of a person on the screen here, and, and this is the oval that represents that person upon the screen. We go to that oval, we go to the dynamic properties, because those are the properties that can change over time, and we're going to set color. And we're going to set as its fill color, it's going to be the value of the variable color. Okay? Um, so, so we just say color. Okay? So that, that is referring to the whatever is in this variable. If it's black, it's going to be black fill. If it's red, it's going to be red fill. Um, so whatever value is in that variable, it's going to use. And if that variable changes, this will automatically update the, the appearance. Okay. Um, okay. Um, where did we use these last time? Where do we use dynamic properties? We actually had a kind of spurt of, of, of fun at the end of last class. Where did we use dynamic properties? Anyone remember? Yeah, the size, the radius. Remember that? We had the radius set according to the income and that sort of stuff. And I think um, some people in the audience went further and, and had it varying over time and, and all sorts of neat stuff than th like that. But um, 
the same sort of attributes we used last time. Okay. Um, okay. So we've just sort of laid the groundwork here for giving agents color. And why don't we run the model? What the heck? Let's let's run it. What should we see right now? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> um, say it like it is. Um, okay. So we we run it, and, and we're going to we're going to see a profusion of, of black dots. Um, and and they're going to have a network behind them, but they're 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 black. And we're different colors, but we have more something interesting. So what are we going to do? Okay, we're going to represent agent behavior here. Right now, agents have been singularly un, uninspiring, not just because of their limited color choices, but uh, because of their lack of behavior. They, they, they don't do anything over time. They are passive, non-changing, static quantities that kind of just sit there like bumps on a log. And we want to give them behavior. We want to give them, we want to give them some evolution uh, over time. Let them pr represent processes with respect to these agents. And one of the best ways of doing this is with a state chart, okay? For a given state chart, we're going to represent an agent as possibly being in one of a set of states. Now, the agent is going to be in exactly one of the most finest grain level states at a time. There's actually going to be composite states, but there's always going to be some states at the finest grain level. It's going to be one at a time. And you're going to have transitions between states that are going to occur over time. And those transitions can be ba can have behind them a set of different logic. And we're going to see that. And, and these transitions occur instantaneously. A given transition, when it fires, it will go quickly and it'll go to another state. Okay? Um, and it, it's triggering, it's firing. The event of occurrence of that transition will be based, ladies and gentlemen, on some condition. It'll be some condition that we specify. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to add in a state chart. Okay. How, how shall we do this? Well, um, we go up and we're going to go to state chart here on the right hand side and uh, it's in the palette and we're going to draw in a state chart entry point drag it in boom and I just leave its name oh I call it infection state chart um, I did it with a capital personally I don't really like it um, but um, I'll do it I think in lowercase infection state chart that's in what's called camel case it uses capitalization to distinguish the different components of the name. And I, I do it as lowercase because it's kind of at the level of a, a variable. It's not a, not a class. So I did it that way. Notice down here, it, it, it's complaining, right? It's, it's saying there's a hanging state chart entry. This doesn't go anywhere. We're going to fix that up. We're going to have it go somewhere. We're going to have it go to some state. So add in a, a state called susceptible. How do we add that in? Well, we just drag it over and try to get it so that it lands on that arrow and then we're going to call it susceptible boom okay so meaning it someone within the state can be infected they're not infected now but they they can be infected okay um and you'll notice that it's it's kind of meshed with that thing so if you drag it around they, they move around as a unit um that it's it's to it as it were um you'll notice that Sometimes it's possible to have them nearby, but they're not connected. The green dot indicates that they're welded. Okay, um, so so if you if you click on this guy here, you'll see there's a green dot here. Um, maybe I need to hand up binoculars for everyone to see it, but but there's a green dot up there. Um, um, out out green dot. No, um, this is uh, this is a, a green dot, and it's a good thing. Um, uh, that green dot indicates that there's a connection between the two, between that entry and the state. And you you want to make sure that otherwise it will complain complain about it down there. Yeah, they're connected. So if if I were to break them apart, um, you know, if I were to drag this up or something, and then I move this around, they're they're not going to be connected. But notice that, see that? It's it's it, it's circular green and boom down. Uh, that's our green dot. 
And um, now, now what I'd like you to do is I want to change the color of the person when they enter this state, okay? So what I'd like you to do is uh, put in a bit of code that says color equals, and you know, I was a little bit uh, sloppy there. I said color equals green, and you can do that, but it's more clear to say color equals color dot green, and other, the green with respect to color, right? Um, uh, so this is the green as defined by color. Mm -hmm. Greenness as defined by this thing color, okay, which, which describes colors in our, our model. Um, so I think it probably doesn't make any sense, but uh, uh, I think that doesn't matter, but why did we call susceptible to uh, this? Well, okay, that's a good question. Um, it's uh, be, because I don't think of it, that's a descriptor of the name of the state. And I don't think of it as kind of either a variable or a, um, or a, uh, a type or anything. And so I didn't have a clear rule in Java as to whether it should be uppercase and lowercase. Um, I, I think it's, it's arguable. And it turns out that you can get that name, that there is a name created in the class. Um, I'm going to. Forgive me, I'm going to lapse into techno jargon for anyone who has this background. It's a, it's a static variable within the class called susceptible. And so maybe you're right. Maybe it should be lowercase. Um, I don't have a clear convention defined with respect to this. And um, I, will take, uh, I will take the suggestion and make this uh, lowercase. Now, I'm going to teach a principle with this. When I go to modify this, you'll notice it says press control enter to perform refactoring. Okay. Um, what this is saying is, if there's anything in my model that refers to it a, in its current name, if I want to correct those automatically, I can press Control Enter. It will kind of ferret through the model, figure out anything that refers to it, and correct them. Okay, or give me the option of correcting them. Um, here, there's nothing else in the model that refers to it, so I'm just going to change it to lowercase. You think it doesn't do that automatically? Uh, no, and in general, programming languages. Um, uh, when you change the name of things, most don't automatically do it. Eclipse, the, the editor based in, uh, that for Java programming, offers that as a so-called refactoring. And, and it's a good thing to do if you think there's any risk, something depends on it. Um, uh, I would note as a virtue of Vensim, one of the great virtues of Vensim, and for that matter, other system dynamics packages, um, Stellar, uh, PowerSim, is that it, when you rename a variable, it's intelligent and it knows, okay, anything that refers to this has kind of got to know about the new name. But in general, that's not done in programming languages. And there's a little bit of philosophy behind it, but um, frankly, I think 99% of the time, you actually do want it to kind of update things. Mm -hmm. You want it to change the, anything that refers to this, you want it to change the name, okay? Um, okay. Well, uh, Anyway, what we've done is uh, we've we've named that. So now we're we're going to add an infective, uh, an infective state. And let's um, uh, spurred by uh, the question. Let's load. Uh, let's name that in lowercase. Okay. So we drag over and we say uh, infective. Okay. And and we're going to set the color here to be red. So we're going to have color equals red. Uh, color dot red. Okay. Why am I doing this? Why why am I setting this color? What I mean, what's the motivation for me modifying color? What happens when I modify color? Can anyone tra trace the thread of my logic? Or is there no method to my madness? Can anyone anyone say why why would I update color? What's That's right. That's right. Visually, we're going to identify. And just to sort of complete that logic, so that's exactly the motivation. To complete that logic at an operational level, why is this, why is this statement, this, this little expression here, going to lead to the color on the screen changing? What is it that links logically this setting this to red to a changing to red on the screen? There's one thing we did which linked it logically. What was that? Uh, 
that that's right. So remember up here, you know, you folks don't have to do this, but remember this, remember this oval up here, we had dynamic and we set the fill color to be color. So as soon as we change the color variable, color, it's going to update the fill color on the screen. Okay. So, so this, this thing here that otherwise seems like an arbitrary little assignment, it has import. It's going to change automatically the color on the screen. Okay, so we're going to do that with Infective, and then uh, we have to we have to connect the two. After all, we have to be able to get to the infected. Oh, I said infected. I, I'm I'm saying infective here. Okay, um, we have to connect the two. To do that, ladies and gentlemen, we need to introduce our first transition. Okay, um, how do we? So what are these transitions? Transitions to describe are, are a construct. Are a, type of, of uh, object within the model that allows us to go between states within a state chart. To transition from one state to another, to move from one state to another, to evolve from one state to another. We use these transitions, okay? And a transition is, is, is reified. It's shown on the screen as, a, as an arrow. So I'd like you to actually add one in here, okay? See over here it says transition, yeah? And you can drag from, hey, oh man, sorry. I have to drag it in and then I've got to connect it up, okay? So uh, there's one end that goes there and then I've got to drag this up until it turns green. And there we go, there's a transition. However, we haven't yet done the real, real job of specifying what's the logic of this transition. This, this, this is kind of like specifying a flow within a system dynamics model. And that's all well and good visually. I mean, that's a, you know, at a qualitative level, when you're specking out a model qualitatively in its earliest stages, this means a lot. It means you can get to this state from that state. And in fact, we'll go further than that and we'll name this thing. We'll name this thing. What, what do you think, what's the name, what would be a meaningful name for this transition? Um, naming a transition just ain't gonna cut it. Infection, yeah, it's really the, the sort of the occurrence of infection, the event of infection um, that's gonna lead to this. So we're gonna say infection. Now, it still doesn't show it uh, on the screen if, if we do that. Um, it just, when we click on it, we'll see it's, a, you'll notice there's a little box here, show name. And in fact, if you click on that, then you'll have a little name here that you can put next to it. And that's kind of a nice documentation, okay? So at a qualitative level, that, that tells a lot. It gives us some information. But to run the model, we need more than that. We need to specify the logic associated with this transition to move in the model formulation stage, making the model unambiguously specified. We have to go from this sort of qualitative depiction to a, a quantitative depiction. Ladies and gentlemen, there are several types of transitions. There's a timeout transition, there's a fixed rate transition, including, by the way, variable rate, well, well ver fixed and variable rate are based on certain rates, certain chance per unit time, a certain hazard for those who are familiar with that term in a statistical sense. Um, so there's a, a likelihood density, um, it would be another term, density, so, uh, chance per unit time likely per unit time that you're going to transition. And you can do it based on a, if you receive a message, you transition. That there's a triggering event. A message is received to me. I'm infected. And I transition. Or it can be based on a condition, a so-called predicate. When a condition becomes true, then I transition. So maybe, you know, uh, I check a condition if there's a certain amount of um, prions in my neighborhood, then I automatically become infected. Maybe it's a message received that if I have contact with someone, I become infected. Or maybe there's just a certain chance per unit time I develop this. Or maybe I'm, after a certain amount of time, I transition to this state of infection. Um, so we can have all of these. And these are different semantically. They're, they're quite different. Timeout, I know is based on a fixed amount of time. You're, you're, it's going to occur at a certain amount of time after you've entered the state exactly. So after exactly, say, 10 time units, 
I'm going to go from being a child to an adult or something like that. Fixed rate is much more similar, ladies and gentlemen, to something you've seen before. And what is that? Most of you have seen it in another class. And what is that? A fixed rate, a, a certain flow. chance per unit time. It's associated with a flow exactly, but it, with a flow, we have a certain, certain quantity per unit time this time. But you could think of it as kind of that flow divided by the amount that's in the stock that, that leads to that flow. So each thing within that stock, each quantity within that stock, each unit of person, or each unit of deer, or each unit of, of, of uh, vaccine has a certain chance of transitioning per unit time. And the flow is just the amount that's in the stock times that chance per unit time of transitioning. So this is very similar to what you have with, with flows. Um, but here we're describing the hazard, the, the chance per unit time that we're going to transition given that we haven't yet left. Um, and this, notably, ladies and gentlemen, this is very significant. Take note. So within a system dynamics model, that rate may be changing over time. The chance per unit time of leaving in a system dynamics model may change over time. True or not? True. So you may have a certain chance you're in the susceptible stock and you have a certain chance per unit time you're going to become infective. And that may be changing over time based on how many other infectives there are out there in the population, etc. But, ladies and gentlemen, it is typically going to be independent of how long you've been in that stock. It is a memoryless process. You're going to have a certain chance. If you're in that stock, it's assumed well mixed that everyone in that stock has a certain chance. Uh, if we're talking about getting infected, there's a certain infection pressure, a certain force of infection that they're subjected to. And no matter how long they've been there, they have that certain chance of leaving. If we're a vaccine you know, uh, dose, we have that certain chance of being shipped per unit time. Here, we can actually have this rate vary, not just over time, the chance varying over time, but according to how long we've been in that state. So the longer we've been there in, a, in an obese state, maybe the higher our chance per year of developing diabetes. Mm -hmm. The longer that we've had undiagnosed infection, say that we've had an active case of TB, the more severe it becomes, and the greater the chance we'll transition to a cavitary TB state, a very serious um, uh, infectious form of TB. So here we can have a variable rate. Um, this message receiving is based on other agents, typically. It's based on agents who are communicating with us. Maybe they send us a message saying they're persuading us of a certain, um, you know, the, the efficacy of a certain uh, form of risk protection. So they persuade us uh, to, to hygienically shield ourselves in an H1N1 infection or what have you. Um, uh, or it may be based on something else within ourselves that, that's going to, to change whether or not we transition between states. And a predicate can be based on a number of things. So transitions can initially be routed via branches, and the, and the branches will determine which way the transition goes from a point. So when someone's infected with TB, they may either go to a latent state, where they stay for years with latent TB, or they go on immediately to an active TB state. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to have a, a certain fixed rate of, of going from susceptible to infectious, okay? Um, so we're going to have a rate, and the set was um, 0.01. So let me ask this. So we're going to go, and you'll notice it says, try to say rate. Oh, look at that. This is do by agent arrivals. You arrive at a certain place. You arrive at the watering hole. You transition to the drinking state. And uh, that's a that's a so new I have a question for our purpose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you transition to nowhere? Do we need this actually an infective um, state? Or because there is an exit action on the um, the, the, There is. So, so in other words. Susceptible, there is an entry action and exit action. Could we just say that oh, okay. color to red when I exit? Um, and have the infection arrow pointing. Yes, you could. So this is a great question. Um, let me 
let me address that in just a second, okay? So that like in a lot of things in any logic, in most things, there's many ways to do, to do things. And this is exactly uh, one of the choices you can make. And I'll come back to it in just a second. Let me just make the point with this transition that this transition is triggered by rate. We're not going to do it as a timeout yet. It could be a condition. It could be based on a message. It could be based on arrival. We're going to just do it as a rate. It's kind of almost the, the simplest assumption. You have a certain chance per unit time of going. Your time in that state is exponentially distributed in a statistical sense. Um, your chance of leaving is given that you're still in that state is independent of how long you've been there and your chance of remaining in that state goes down exponentially over time. Um, so this is a rate of 0.01. Let me ask this, those who have been in the system dynamics course, if you have a chance of 0.01 per unit time of leaving, how long on average are you in that state? How long are you on average in the successful <coughs> state? If you have a chance of 0.01 per time unit of leaving? 100. Yeah. 1 over 0 0.01 common sort of reasoning we use in system dynamics models with, with respect to flows actually, um, particularly the hazard is explicitly specified. Okay, now um, to answer the question, uh, Sergey is it? Yes. yes. Um, Sergey's question, you'll notice that he was asking there's an entry action here and then there's an exit action. And similarly, this has an entry act, uh, action and an exit action. And you know, you'll notice that the entry action here is turns this green, the entry action here turns this red. And I think he was asking, couldn't we have just made the action to turn red associated with this transition? Um, so we could have made, when this transition fires, perform this action, turn red. Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, we could. However, if, if there were multiple transitions between susceptible and back, like multiple routes of transmission, maybe vertical transmission versus transmission through the environment versus transmission from direct person-to-person uh, -person contact, rather than putting it separately for all those transitions, we might just be better off putting it in, in this and just say when it's entered, we, we go to it, rather than worrying about where it came from, right? Um, so that's a trade-off. Uh, I think it's a matter of some aesthetics for a given model, which one you do it as. But let me ask this. See how it says action, and then it says guard. Action specifies what to do when we have that transition. What, what thing do we want to perform? Um, and here we, we could change color. Guard says, under what conditions do we perform that action? Not under what conditions do we transition. That is specified by this up here. But instead, this specifies under what conditions do we perform that action. And if we perform it under all conditions where this transition fires, we just leave it blank. Okay? So it's an important sort of distinction for guard. Um, okay, so what I'd like to suggest is let's, um, let's run this model. Okay? So um, we're going we're gonna to do. Uh, I'm going to do it with a smaller population. We still have that around. I'm going to do it with a smaller population. Boom. Okay. So we're running it, and um, and there we go. And you'll notice. Oh, look at that. What do we see? What's going on here? Okay. And in fact, if we drill down, what we can see is you'll notice that oh, this person's in the infective state, right? This person here is also in fact, oh, this person is susceptible. Okay, susceptible, susceptible, susceptible. Um, and this one, okay, hey, we, oh, we hit, oh boy, um, we had a long streak of susceptibles. Now, now we are back to an infective person. It shows where they are in the network. The infectives, not surprisingly, are red. The, the other ones are still green. Um, you'll notice it, it highlights which one it's in up, up there. Okay, so, um, and of course, there's still these characteristics up here, which we had set before. Okay, so now behavior. Um, maybe, maybe we want something, some other form of feedback. I'm, I'm going to show you just a little thing, just in, in principles of this action. Let's, let's, Sergey has, has triggered some desire to illustrate triggering. Um, so, in action, um, I'm going to put in a thing that says trace ln, and I'm going to say, I got infected. Um, this, is, this is actually going to put a message out. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, I'm going to do more than that. Right now it says I, but who knows who I is? There's all these different agents, and each of them are just going to say I. It's going to be a cacophony. So I'm going to say, um, I'm going to put in something that says this. What is this? What is this, this? What, what, what is, to what does um, the term above my finger refer? Yeah, it, it, so this, this whole thing is occurring for a given person, right? This is describing agentness, personness. And when it's actually running, this is going to be running for a given person. And the term this refers to me. It's, it's me. And I'm going to be saying, this is saying, hey, print out something that says me. And this is, what this is implicitly saying is my name got infected. So this, this plus is just saying, hey, put, put the, the version of this as, as sort of a, a so-called string, a, a bunch of characters, together with this thing here. Put it all into one thing so I can print it out. Okay? That's what the plus means. It's actually not addition. It's concatenation, as we call it. You're, you're putting, it's like a suffix and a prefix. This is the prefix. This is the my name. And it's going to be put next to and the string got infected. So I'm going to run this thing, OK? So, so let's, let's run this again uh, with that. And, and let's see what happens. So I'm going to say run. That was LN was the, was the word for that, OK? And I'm going to run. And here we have this going on. You'll notice it's coming along. OK, so now, now we have red thing. And you notice it says, OK, hey, these different people got infected, right? And I can terminate it here. But you'll notice it's now reporting who got infected. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would hazard, if you're going to be doing any significant work with any logic, trace ln will be your friend. Um, and uh, it may be unassuming friend, but it will, you'll use it to figure out what's going on a fair bit. So, so uh, you can get familiar with it. This is one example of sort of reporting using that. Um, so we see the names of the different agents that got infected. Yeah. Okay, so the guard specifies the conditions under which action will or will not occur. Um, no, so so okay, so let's be uh, so we have to be clear about it. It's, it's actually a little bit confusing. So let me, I'm going to repeat something I said. And forgive me. Um, so we're ne we're going to need to distinguish between two things here. One, the conditions under which the transition will fire. Okay? In other words, the conditions under which here you will go from susceptible to infected. There'll be some set of conditions under which you'll go between them. Okay? And, um, and those conditions are specified up, up here. Okay? This section here specifies what to do when, when that transition occurs beyond actually going between states. That automatically is going to happen when the transition goes. But the action is going to specify what additional things do you want to, to make happen when that transition occurs. And what this is saying is, I want to print out this thing. Okay. Now, the guard is going to allow you to say, is allow you to suppress the action that would occur normally with the transition under certain conditions. But a guard this being true or not will affect whether or not this fires. This being true or not will not affect, I'm uh, sorry, whether this not this action occurs. This being true or false will not affect whether, in fact, the transition occurs. So um, yeah, we could, have, we could have a transition that only occurs for people of a certain income, but that would be specified using um, using something like option, for example, that under certain conditions it will fire. But this guard specifies whether or not the action is going to accompany the transition. If the transition is going to happen, the question is, is the action then going to happen or not? Does that make sense? OK, great, great question. C 
right, right now, I'm illustrating this in the most simplistic way. We're going to show it with connections in just a moment. Okay. How, how it, this, this is just to illustrate how you start to describe logic for transitions. And in this case, we're going to be moving very rapidly to a situation where the infection spreads. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, right. So, um, what you could do here is, and I'm going to have to remember um, this. I think you could do like, um, I'm trying to remember how you get the agent number. Um, get um, th there's a way to obtain the agent, and I can't remember um, off the top of my head. Um, so. Uh, get, um, is it get ID, no, or get num, no. There, so there's a, there's a way to get the, the get in, yeah, maybe it's get index. Ah, oh, there it is, get index, yeah. Um, so, so I could have get index, if get index is even, um, so uh, this is, is, is what you'd want. So um, this, this, this is, looks like gibberish to some people, but what this is saying is modulo. So this is going to get the index number. Is this agent 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, um, what have you. And this takes modulo 2. So th that's going to, so it's going to go, you know, 0 would be, modulo 2 would be 0, uh, 1 modulo 2 would be 1, 2 modulo 2 would be 0, 3 modulo 2 would be 1. And, and then it's testing if that's uh, 0 or 1. And, to be honest, um, I don't happen to remember off the top of my head. If, uh, I think if the guard is true, then it's fire. Um, but um, you know, uh, watch this. Let's let's speed this up. Boom, uh, ba boom. The entire effect, uh, I think everything is infected. So here, only even agents are reporting it. You notice that. However, let's let's run that again. I, I shouldn't have been so casual about showing it the depiction. Um, boom. Okay, now I'm gonna run this in max mode. Okay, um, okay, now that's interesting. Um, so, oh, because it only oh, it went up to time infinity. Okay, that's, that's interesting. So why didn't those other agents get infected? That's very, because um, the guard should have affected whether or not it got printed, not whether or not it got transitioned. Let's, let's go experiment with this. Um, uh, I'm wondering if uh, so. I'm I'm drawing my understanding from a previous version of any logic, but let's uh, let's verify this. Okay, let's suppose I remove this guard, right? Um, now we could do this in a couple of different ways. I'm just going to uh, delete it, and we'll run it. Watch this, boom. Um, so a bit of debugging here, and it's a good thing to see. Okay, so now I'm running run it as fast. Ah, so I stand corrected. The guard is in fact interacting with the transition. It is evidently a transition from firing. So I stand I stand corrected. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. Sorry? So that I don't have any guard. So you think it could be So you eliminated the formula. Huh. That's time infinity. They should all have been infected by then. Um, I was pretty sure about uh, that interpretation of guard. So, but it is now, and if I put that guard back to, um, well, I mean, it, look, there's an, e an easier thing we could do too. I could just have the guard be false, right? <laughs> and uh, let's see if anyone gets infected, right? Um, so I said guard equals false, and no one's getting infected. All of the. So if you actually run it, yeah. you agents, you'll see. Uh, yeah, yes, that's time till the transition will occur. So where um, no, so uh, it has to do with how the scheduling works. Um, so so let's. Uh, sorry, let me let me put that. Blank. So folks, uh, it looks like um, uh, I don't know if I if they changed it between two versions of any logic or if I misspoke, but 
but this guard is in fact overriding whether or not the transition fires. Um, so it's sort of something beyond the, the, the condition. So um, uh, here, let's, let's go take a look at, at what you're asking about. So uh, we're gonna go run this um, and, and we'll go do this, okay. And now we're gonna drill down, right? And what you're talking about is this sort of thing, eh? Yeah, um, so this is the time till this transition will occur. It pre-schedules that. So coming in there, it's able to sort of, coming into that state, it's gonna actually draw a number uh, based on, in this case, it's an exponential distribution because uh, it knows that it's a fixed rate. It's gonna be able to draw a number and use that as the time it'll be leaving. So well, okay, so you can in fact have a changing rate, in which case you'll be constantly recomputing it. But basically coming into that state, it's gonna look at all the outgoing transitions and it's over, it's gonna be trying to pre-schedule what it can and where uh, and necessarily reevaluating things, like reevaluating conditions under which it will transition and it will then leave by the first one that it's gonna go. And the reason this works in an, a discrete event model is remember, it's not running uh, by default, it's not running step by step by step. So it's trying to figure out kind of what's the next time it has to get to, to jump to. And so if the next time it has to jump to is 100 time units from now, if that's the next event, it's gonna, w it's gonna just go jump to that time step. And then yeah. the question I had is, is yeah. could you do this to a whole set of variables? Where you simply said that Yes, oh yeah, you could do it, yeah. And in fact, traditional agent-based modeling what you see graphically depicted here will be captured instead in, in a bunch of code. It'll be uh, captured in class code and methods and so on, and that's the classic way of doing this. But frankly, it's a lot more transparent when you have it as a state chart. And we're gonna see that these state charts can generalize in some very nice ways, okay? So you can have multiple you can have charts with composite states. You can have state charts whose values hinge on reception of messages and all those sort of things. And the code to implement that by hand will be pretty messy. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Um, and if this is varying rate, that will be recomputed periodically. So just because it computes that doesn't mean it's going to leave via that transition. It's just, it's gonna compute that and it will reevaluate it where necessary. And you know maybe it'll start thinking it's 20 time units off. And then the rate's gonna be increasing and periodically it's gonna be reevaluating and say, oh, it's now it's only 10 time units off, even though it's only time five. And so it can actually reevaluate this. Just because it's pre-scheduling, it doesn't mean it's predetermined to go that way. It's just, it, it needs to determine what's the next point in time in terms of the so-called discrete event scheduler for to get to, okay? And it's just scheduled, there's an underlying schedule which is scheduling events. And it's got to figure out, okay, what's my next event I've got to handle? And this, this transition here is sort of pre-scheduled initially, but there may, be another there may be another event which is periodically updating this rate, in which case it's gonna be constantly recalculating, when do I leave with this transition? So, it's a little bit complex, and I don't wanna deal with all the vagaries of it right now. But suffice it to say that the underlying scheduling is very sophisticated and can adapt to uh, time-bearing rates, okay? It's not actually as rigid as you might think. Yeah. So if you wanted to impose conditions that you did the guard, that the field yeah. degrees, the guard, that the right. how would you do that if else? Uh, so, so you're saying if you didn't have guard here or yeah. something? Well, there isn't, and you can actually say under what conditions is this going to fire? Um, and uh, those conditions could specify um, things involving sort of the agent number and stuff like that. Um, the guard allows you, it looks like, I mean, I, I had misinterpreted, I don't, again, I don't know if I'm misremembering from previous version or what, but, um, the guard gives you the flexibility, like if you have a rate, um, it may sort of calculate that. When it comes there, you can check this guard, and if, it, if it's not true, then it's, it's gonna go back and probably recalculate when to leave next um, again. So I don't know if that makes sense. 
Okay. So, um, some more questions right now? With respect to this, we're going to see a lot more of these transitions, and hopefully they'll illustrate this. Okay, so we wanted a rate of 0 0.01. SM. And, uh, okay, what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to add a reverse transition now between these two. Um, so a transition in the other way. And I'm not too specific about which side it's depicted on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, sorry. Um, okay, we drag it in there. Hey, no, no, no. Um, okay, it's going the other way, so I'm going to have to leave it out here and probably just boom. Um, and uh, boom. Okay. Um, so there we go. So now we have a reverse tra transition. I'd like to, to be to be 0 0.1, okay? Uh, rate of the other transition was what? Anyone remember? Uh, okay, so so what should we see now if we run this model? What do you think you'll see? Okay, so you'll see blinking. Will most be in the uninfected state? Uninfected, because what? Because getting a lot better a lot faster than they're getting infected so let's let's sort of speed this up you can do this with this plus thing here and and you'll see sort of a blinking it's not it's not the holiday season anymore but uh, this would be a, a site you might see in December and and um, it's it's kind of blinking away um, so these things are are around. okay so now I'm going um, okay yeah we we had this um, I'd like you to well, okay, and then we'll changing the semantics of this transition. So, go think about this. So, rates and flow. So, you've seen fixed rates before uh, in the form of transition rates um, within models, uh, within compartmental or, or system dynamics models. So, um, you know, commonly within these models, we'll have some value of a stock and then some rate of transition, some chance per unit time that someone's going to leave, conditional on them being in the stock. So, the rate of the flow, the number of people per unit time leaving, say, would be the stock times this, uh, this rate of flow. Um, and, you know, these things are go by different names. Transition rate, the likelihood of transition per unit time, so per week, the likelihood of infection per week or per year or what have you. And the uh, transition hazard um, would be a, a term you might use in competing risks analysis, etc. Um, so, for example, you might have an immunity loss delay and you have the number of the, the rate here of people, whoa, uh, here will be T times one over immunity loss delay, where one of immunity loss delays is associated with a, with, a, with a hazard. That's the hazard. Or you have an annual risk of death and people flow out of here with some annual risk, so risk per unit time of dying. And really that corresponds quite directly to the sort of rates we've just seen. Um, and, you know, if you have a mean time until death here in a stock and flow model, the, the transition rate, the hazard, is just one over this. Um, you can represent this flow, you know, using this divided by that, which is just, of course, math mathematically, this times one over that, right? It's just, th that's a, a familiar thing. So fixed rates are, are hazards. Um, we're dealing with the chance of individual transitions. We don't need to um, multiply by the number of people at risk here. Um, we're dealing with each individual. Um, and these rates can change over time, but importantly, here, the rates for an individual can change over time depending on how long they've been there. But the state chart needs to be made aware of these changes. So um, there's, there's a couple ways of doing this within any logic. But fundamentally, if your chance per unit time of leaving that state and going to this next state changes based on how long you've been here, for example, in the susceptible state, you have to get it to kind of recalculate at what time you're, you're going to leave. Um, so uh, we'll see some examples uh, of that. In the meantime, though, I'd like, to, um, I'd like to go back and I'd like to look at a fixed residence time, OK? Sometimes we have processes that occur according to fixed schedules. It's not a chance per unit time. It's, it's more or less uh, fixed. So in a non-relativistic context, 
um, aging is a fixed, occurs at a fixed rate. Um, and uh, similarly, so, so you might, you know, go between um, uh, age zero and one, and one and two, and two and three, and at some fixed time. It's exactly a year's time. Not on average a year's time, but, but exactly. Um, and uh, similarly, there might be some processes associated with treatment, uh, uh, delivery of an intervention, which are occurring on very well-defined time constants. Um, and uh, we can impose that using what are called timeouts within our model. So what I'd like to do is to, um, to go to this model and now make these things timeouts, okay? So what we had here was a rate of 0 0.01 going from susceptible to I'd like to set a timeout with that same average time in the state. So given that this is 0 0.01, how long on average does one stay susceptible before getting infected? We said it earlier. 100. So let's change this to a timeout of 100. So change it to be a timeout and time 100. Okay. So now it's going to be exactly after 100 time. And the reverse, how long on average will we remain infected before transitioning back? 10. Set that to a timeout of 10. Okay. Um, so now we have a, a difference. That, now, what should we see that's different? Okay, so visually, do you think it will look different? Okay, so this is what you should see. Um, we're going to speed it up here. Um, come on. Hey. <laughs> hey, oh, oh, look at that. Um, okay, that, that, that was interesting. Um, uh, uh, I thought we changed that to uh, maybe go check that out. So, so this was uh, a timeout there, and this was a timeout there. So they should be, they should be uh, all in sync, in fact. Um, and uh, oh, you know, maybe I'll do it with this with a small pause. It's more easily visible. But um, what you should see is a blinking, sort of a. a blink. Um, uh, it can be, okay, so this is, this is, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, it can be, a, it, so, so you can in fact, let's, let's go try this right now. You can in fact have it be a timeout, but this could be drawn from a distribution. So now, what this is saying is you're going to be leaving at, a, at exactly a time, but the exact amount of time is going to be drawn from a distribution, right? Um, so... Uh, that may be different for each uh, for each person, for example, um, and we could we could have that that sort of situation. You're leaving at, a, at precisely a time, and we draw it instead of from an exponential distribution, from a normal distribution, or from a beta distribution, or from a Poisson distribution, or what have you. Okay. Um, I believe it would transition immediately. And in fact, this could be zero, and, and uh, it, uh, it could be zero, and it will it'll transition immediately. I think the same thing if it's negative. Although, here, let's let's give it a try. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so right, it was normal. Um, oh, look at that. Ah, uh, negative timeout. <laughs> okay, <laughs> not quite so nice. Um, I thought it would go immediately. However. Let's, let's give it a timeout of zero, see what you get. Um, uh, so, so, you know, what you would do is you would do a, uh, a max of, of zero in, in a, something drawn normal, say, um, to avoid that. Okay, so let's try this. Boom, boom. Um, and timeout of zero, it should, uh, yeah, it goes immediately. I think it was a display artifact. I, th I think I think actually it was just trying to keep up with how quickly they were going. I mean, we should be able to. Let me do it. Um, I'm going to do it with a with a. I sped it up hugely, and then it was trying to speed up. Let's let's do ten for each of them, and then let's try to do this because um, they should all go in blank. I've run this this thing. Okay, here we go. Okay, so so I'm going to speed it up. So 
and then oh yeah yeah it's uh i think it's just sort of catching up with all the events because actually each you know it's scanning through the agents and some of them goes at the logically it's the same time but it's but it's sequential like uh, no i think it's a display artifact i think it's a, in other words um they're occurring at the same virtual time even though on the screen you see it you see it in the process of updating it sort of as it's going through all the agents and it doesn't go through them all in immediately but it displays them immediately yeah okay so well, next time out yes um, yeah Correct. So let's let's do that. Let's let's. Uh, I, I like the idea. So let's uh, let's go back to that transition, and um, and you say and the time is, um, and uh, I think it's it's time. Um, this is what is this? What am I putting in here? What am I doing with trace ln? What what is this thing? What am I doing with uniform when I I am calling a method it's called. I'm, I'm saying, hey, go trace the line, do this for me with this information. Um, uniform calculated value between this and this. Time, this is actually a, a method. It's saying, get me the time, fetch me the time. Um, so uh, let's, let's go do that, right? So we're going to run this thing now. And um, if, if indeed this is correct, discrepancy, they should all go at exactly the same virtual time, true or not? Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. Um, that's right. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop this here, and I'm gonna just things are printed. What's called the console, and um, it's printed here, and, and you can quickly by inspection kind of see that it's all it's all at the same time. Yeah. Okay, so so go to the go to the um, experiment, and what you go to is model time, and you can see it it says stop never, and uh, start time and, and stop time, um, yeah, and uh, and there's some more sophisticated things you could do, but yeah, that's the that's the way. Um, okay, um, so I'm gonna uh, skip over some things. So, um, right. Um, so if we want, um, so we can have a, I'm not going to have you load in this model, even though it's provided to you. But um, one thing you could do is you could have something here, have a rate or a timeout. Um, so for example, um, I could have this, uh, this rate here uh, depend on how long I've been in this state, right? Um, so my chance of leaving the state depends on um, on how long I've been here. And in fact, there's a way within any logic to ask for for how long I have been here. And I'm going to see if I can remember it off the top. It's called um, get. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so residence. Uh, no, it's it's. Um, Oh gosh, um, uh, there's a, there's a, it's something along the idea of residence time, but um, uh, time and state. Um, so I'm not going to remember it uh, right now. I was hoping I would, but um, you could do that, or you could um, you could do it based on um, their age, for example. Um, so here, what we'll do is we'll add a system dynamics component. This is an easy way to do it. So I will have in the system dynamics component a uh, stock here, and I'll have to be their age, and there'll be a flow in. Um, so I'm going to drag a flow over here. Oh, look at that! Woo, that's a big arrow. Um, uh, and so this will be called aging process. Um, oh, come on! And and then connect with that. Yeah, and uh, they've changed this quite a bit between versions. Okay, um, there we go. So this is their age, their aging, it starts at age zero, right? And we could have their infection, uh, oh, their aging will be a, uh, a rate of one. <laughs> um, 
so they're going to age at one unit per unit time. This is actually a better way to do aging, but this will illustrate the principle. And then we could have the rate depend on their age, right? The, the older they are, the higher the chance to get uh, infective. Now, if we were to do this, however, um, it turns out that, that any logic coming to susceptible state sort of pre-schedules at what time to do this. Kind of waking it up and saying, hey, go figure out again how quickly you're going to leave. And there's ways of doing that. And one of them is a so-called tr self-transition. You transition from the state back to itself. And it's kind of re-entering the same state and calculate all the transitions leave, leaving the state. So you could do that. Um, and uh, what you could do is with a state chart here, have a transition from this state ooh, to itself. And, um, and there's a way to kind of uh, get these things to, um, to bend around. Um, so if you, if you go and you double click, I think it is, on, on these, uh, excuse me, is it control double click? Um, you can, you can bend these things around so they go back to the same state. Now, I'll just pull it through and connect it like that. And um, we could have this go off every time unit. And by doing that, it will now be calculating the chance per unit time. Every unit of time, it'll be recalculating the chance of leaving, okay? And uh, we can go simulate this then and uh, have agents who age are more and more likely to, to get infected. Um, so there's a higher and higher sort of rate of infection over time. And in fact, these are getting infected so quickly that they're only very transiently getting, getting better. You can see the sort of beeping out there. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, sure. So, um, so uh, sort of mechanically how I do it or? Okay, so, okay, so all I did is I dragged this in here, okay, and then I connected one one edge of the state with 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 that, or one edge of the transition with that state, and then the other edge of the transition with the state, and then it's a self transition. It goes from itself, to, uh, and then I had a timeout of one here, yeah, okay. Um, that will get it to recalculate all rates going out, okay. Uh, no, in some cases it can. Um, uh, th there are cases where if you have certain mechanisms, it will automatically recalculate that, um, automatically recalculate those rates. In general, you, unless, unless you're quite sure it's going to be recalculating, you're going to want to sort of make sure that it's recalculating it. What's the value of aging? Sorry? Aging versus value of low aging? Oh, uh, so the, the, it's one. It, you're aging one year per, per year of time. You know? um, so if, if we run this model, we should be able to see, by the way, this is the first hybrid model we built. It says discuss in it, right? And if we run this now, what you'll see is as you run it, you go down to the level of agents and see they have value five, six, and so their age is seven, et cetera, right? Um, um, so their age is changing over time um, according to that stock and flow. And you can also calculate the amount of time they spent smoking over their entire life, for example. Um, so it would only accumulate when they're in a smoking state, et cetera. Uh, yeah. 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 So what I was indicating to Todd is um, there are certain constructs in your model, in which case it will automatically recalculate the age uh, and, and the time of that transition. But if you didn't have to self-transition in general, it might just calculate it once, and it won't be recalculated every every time age changes. So it's a sort of a trick to, uh, to existing yeah, there's yeah. sort of a modeling sense. There, there's another, correct, there's another way to do it, uh, which um, is through what's called on change. But this is kind of a trick to get it to recalculate this, yeah. It's, it's not particularly deep in terms of any modeling significance. It's just a way to kind of get it to wake up periodically and recompute the rate, okay? Um, Okay, so um, I'm going to just talk about a couple other things here. One thing is a conditional transition. So you'll notice that over in your palette, there's a thing called a branch. And a branch allows you to have a um, uh, have transition which then will split to go to one of two places. So for example, um, you may have a branch here 
and uh, so we'll, we could drag it over. And this branch will have a certain outcome. So one, some part of the time it will go one way, some part of the time it will go another way. Okay. Um, and uh, so perhaps, for example, we'd have a recovery from infection, and some part of the time it will go back, oops, to the susceptible state, and some part of the time maybe it will go to a death state. Um, and uh, and uh, we could drag in a final state here, and we'll connect um, on this transition, we'll connect the other part of the branch to, to this. Um, so under some, under some conditions, the person will recover, other conditions, they will die. And, and what you'll see is that um, if you look at, at this branch, um, you can have an action when you come into the branch, but you'll notice the transition out. Um, it, you can specify for the transi uh, transition out. Is that the default transition, or is it only going to be taken with a true transition? Uh, you know, under a certain condition. And the same for, thing for these others. So one of these can be default, and like we can make the one that goes back to susceptible the default transition. And the death transition, maybe we will um, have a chance of point. Point one, or something along those lines. So we could have, um, you know, draw a uniform from zero to one, and if it's less than point one, then we will go to this death state. Okay. So we're sort of rolling the dice, and if we get unlucky, if it's between zero and point one, we will go to the state. So you notice what it is. I set this is the default out of this branch. And I set this guy based on this condition, uniform of one. What does that do? What does this uniform of one do? It draws a random number between 0 and 1. And if it's less than point zero, 0 0.1, then it will go to this death state. In other words, there's a 10% chance that we'll go to the death state. Now, there's actually a nicer, cleaner way of doing it. I was using a primitive we had used before, but you can actually do something called random true, okay? And you just give it a probability, 0.1. And it will either return true or false, okay? Um, and, and then we'll go to a death state. And the death state, I think what we should do is we should color the person's color black, okay? Um, the black. Now, later we'll talk about how you actually um, delete people from the model. Um, and we'll see that, and, and maybe I'll do that for, for just a minute. Um, here, but let, we can run this model. And what? Oops. Oh, too many defaults. Okay, I have two exits from this that are default. Let's make sure of this. This should this should be condition. Okay. Yeah. And this should be default. Is there is there another one here that I'm missing? Um, so let's go look. This is in person. I'm going to go look over here, state charts, infection state chart. Oh, look at that. It's a transition one, transition two, and then there's a thing called transition. I should really name them something better. Um, this is called infection. This is called, so we should call this something like recovery. Um, recovery. Um, let's call this, um, uh, um, so, uh, you know, death. And we'll call this one. We'll call this one. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, pa uh, uh, <laughs> so so uh, um, beyond uh, beyond infection or something like that. I don't. I'm like a better term for it. Um, but uh, okay. So now we have uh, we have these and. Uh, we should be able to now run the model. I'm not sure. Um, I didn't see any problem with the with the transitions, but okay, there we go. And now what we should see is that uh, occasionally, okay, um, these ones are ah now they're occasionally dying. See the black, they're becoming in a black state. So they're occasionally recovering. Now here they're getting reinfected very quickly because we've made it based on aging and their age is going up. And so they get reinfected quicker and coming black over, over time. Um, here what we've done is we've had a little 
a little uh, branch which represents uh, transition within our model. And we've had an exit point, uh, which we might, as might associate with death. Okay. Um, we can have parallel state charts very readily in any logic. So you might have said TB, diabetes, tobacco use. And you're in exactly one, the person will be in exactly one state, the agent will be in exactly one state with respect to each of these state charts at a given time. So they might be in a particular diabetes state, a particular TB state, and a particular tobacco use state at a given time. You notice, incidentally, that this is a, a little thing that keeps track of the time since they quit. Um, you could have the amount of time that they, number of cigarettes they've smoked over their life or what have you. Um, okay. Um, I want to make a delineation of this from classic compartmental or, or SD modeling where we have a population divided according to state. For an aggregate model with stocks and flows, individual states are discrete, right? So we have susceptible, infected, recovered, for example. And that's very similar to what we can have here. However, um, here, one state within a given state chart is exactly active at a time. We don't, it's, it's on a per person basis. So a person is either in one state, in a state chart or another state. For parallel flows, where we have different state charts, we don't have to, in an aggregate model, we would have to consider, for example, susceptible with respect to seasonal flu and susceptible with respect to H1N1 uh, in fact, with respect to one and susceptible with respect to the other, all combination. Here you have two neatly defined susceptible infected recovered with respect to each one independently. And similarly, instead of considering all possible combinations of diabetes and TB um, within stocks, within stocks, for example, you could have two parallel state charts that neatly separate the two out. And we can keep track of how long an individual has been in a state and report that as an aspect of their history or adjust the transition rate accordingly. And that is very notable because, in general, we don't, don't have that option. Um, okay, ah, here we go. Um, uh, this, is, this is an example, yes, of, of well, adjusting, adjusting the rates. Okay, I'd like to sort of finish today's by looking at a somewhat more complex state chart and I'd like you to open up the sample model, um, predator, prey, agent base. So let's go up to help, and we go up to um, uh, example models. And uh, this is going to appear somewhere on your screen. Um, and what you should be able to do is go down and select predator, prey, agent based. You'll notice there's there's two predator, prey. So be sure to pick the predator prey agent based. Okay. based. You see some more advanced features of state charts that I want to highlight, um, uh, but I also want to use it to, to reinforce things. Okay, so let's go back to the, to the slides here. Um, uh, okay, come on. Um, okay. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted. Come on. Um, come on. Okay. Um, Okay, so if you double click on links, so there's two, there's two types of, of agent shown here. One is the hair and one is a links, okay? So double click on links. Um, well, okay, excuse me folks, just for didactic reasons, let's first go look at hair. What do you see with hair is a singularly simplistic state chart. Um, there's a single state alive and there's two transitions out of it. Um, this is kind of a grim, um, a grim view of life. Uh, um, so you either die because of age or you were eaten by a lynx. Um, and those are the two m routes from liveness to deathness. Um, uh, let's go look at lynx though. Double click on lynx. What you see here is that there's uh, a, a nested hierarchy of state charts, uh, our states. So there's one state chart, but within it we have several sub states. So that there's a, a hunt state in the middle. Um, there's an outermost state that captures the time since, since one was born. Um, and, and we keep track of that for natural deaths. Um, there's a middle state that captures the time since one last ate. And 
and if when you eat, you kind of re-enter that state, so it reinitializes it. And then there's an inner state that that capitalize uh, that captures the hunting frequency and, and success. And you note this transition here. What do you think this transition corresponds to? So, what what do you think this this corresponds to here? Yeah, exactly. So you, you, you start to hunt, and the question is, do you succeed or not? If you if you have no luck, you go back to this state here, out of which you'll you'll start to hunt. So maybe you you know recuperate a bit, and then you'll come down here. You'll trigger again a hunting event. Um, otherwise, if you are successful, you go back and you you eat, and so you re-enter this state, and it will sort of keep track once again of of, of how long you you've uh, been since since you've eaten. Um, the the lighter this this one out here. So, sorry, this one here. Oh, this guy here. Okay, so that that can that's a state which allows you to capture how long it's been since you last ate. So you can think of it as being a state that's. Um, it, it's kind of, it's a little bit of a of a difficult thing to map it to a a well defined sort of physiological state, but. It's sort of uh, being in a state um, that you uh, you're waiting to eat or something like that. Sorry, states within states. And so while you're waiting to eat, you may go hunting, and when you do eat, you re-enter this waiting to eat state. Okay, um, and then you have a, a transition to natural death based on length's life expectancy, exactly a timeout. And then another one, if you, if you, um, you have a timeout, so this is important. You have a timeout out of that state that you were just asking about. Uh, after a certain amount of time, the length's hunger death threshold. If you don't leave this state, this, this sort of intermediate state, through having eaten within a certain amount of time, you will then die through, through having run out of, of, of food. So how do you enter the hunt state, the, the dark yellow one? So, okay, yellow. So, so the dark hunt, uh, the, the dark state, um, or the sort of this, this innermost state, right. that innermost state represents a state of sort of you're waiting to hunt. And um, that actually is going to be the very first state that you enter. Um, there's this kind of state transition. This is sort of, you start here. So within this outer state, you start in this one. Within that one, you start in here. And then periodically, you're going to wake up and hunt. And in fact, we could go look at the logic of that on the screen. So um, you can go click on this transition. And, um, and you'll note, oops, sorry, this transition here. Come on. Um, so uh, after a timeout of the lynx hunting period, the time between hunting, you're going to go hunt. And at that time then, with a certain probability, this is the default actually, certain uh, probability you're going you're gonna to eat. And you'll notice that this is based on a complex formula, um, which is based on how many hairs are around you. This is a spatial model. And if we, maybe I should have started this by running it, um, but if, if you were to run it, is that there's lengths in space. And um, how many, how many, uh, so we're going to slow this down a little bit. Um, so let me go. We're not going to do this as fast as we can. We're going to do it at a more modest. These lengths are the red here, the hairs are the green. And your chance of succeeding in a hunt is going to, as a lynx, as a one of the red, it's going to depend on how many hares are around you, nearby you. And um, if, if there's a lot of hares, you're more likely to succeed in your hunt. If there are fewer hares, you're more likely to hunt. And, and so this eat transition, which sort of sates you and resets your time since eating, is, has a chance of transitioning that's based on um, based on the number of, of, of hairs that are located around you. So the condition here, the chance that you go that way, is based on how many uh, hairs are in the cell. 
And we're not going to go into all the logic of this. We'll take a look at this model more when we talk about spatial movement. But um, suffice it to say that this takes into account in terms of the likelihood of succeeding in your hunt on your local environment. So, so it's a good question. So what you'll notice is that these little stubs that you'll see, these are what are called initial state pointers. And you'll notice that there's the two of them that are notable. One is here and one is here. And what this is saying is if you get into this, this outermost state, you will then go, go in fact, into, into this state, okay? And so if you get in this state, this is the state you start in, this one here. Oh, so you're you're simultaneously in those nested states. That's why I was saying with a state chart, um, if you have uh, the most specific level of states, like these states here, you're only in one at a time. Here you're only in one at a time. However, you can be in sort of nested states simultaneously. Okay. So when you return to that intermediate state, it yep. resets that inner yes. hunt state sort of? That's, that's correct. You start over in that you, state? You start over in that state, but more than that, it resets um, the uh, the uh, amount of time it's been since you last ate. So okay. this transition out here, this transition to death, that's going to occur after a certain time, a lynx hunger death threshold. This is going to occur out. But if you re-enter that state, you're now going to be starting afresh, and death is not going to be at your door. So, so that's third right. Say that again? This one? No, no, the, the oh, this guy here. Conceptually, yeah. when you come out and re enter this state, you're going to end up going right in here. Sorry? This one? No, no. So when this comes out, mm -hmm. you're going to go back into this green, it's sort of greenish tinged state. Is that mauve? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's mauve, but in any case, uh, so you're not going but to you're going to be going to this state dot. here. Yeah, because this dot is going to say, hey, if you're in here, what's the state you start in? There might be several states in here. It's this one here. This one says, if you're in, in this broad state, which is the state you're going to start in? It's this one. So there's no timeout in terms of after you eat, you don't have to hunt for a little while. Mm -hmm. You go straight into the hunting. Correct. Well, you, you go into this, this mode here, I mean, this state here is kind of like you're waiting to hunt. Right. And every lynx hunting period, you're going to go. But there's no kind of, oh, I'm sated, I'm right. full, I'm right. going to sleep. Have too many right. What's that? We can never have too many hair, hairs or whatever. That, that's right. right. They, they just go back you're to the state where hungry. they're kind of, yeah, you're always hungry and, and exactly. And there's going to be some time between your hunts, but it's not going to change it whether or not you just ate. Right. It's, it's sort of memoryless as far as what you're eating was with respect to that period. Okay, so so we actually some more complex types of state charts, and um, I, I provide some comments on them. Okay, here are some comments. Oh, there's this is the thing I couldn't remember. Um, to determine length of time spent in a state, you can use state name uh, dot get local time, and uh, so actually this is the state chart. Get local time, and then you specify the name of the state you're in. So you could say, "How long have I been in the X state?" And that state name is is just the name you see uh, in the in the state chart. So um, within our model, it would have been, for example, um, uh, susceptible or infectious or what have you. Um, um, so we could have asked infection state chart um, and long. Okay. Um, to determine the current state, you can ask the state chart, tell me what state I'm in. And it will tell you, it will return the name of the state or the number of the state that you're in. Um, to find out if a state is currently active, am I in this state, I can ask the state chart, is this state active? And give it the name of the state chart, of the state. In fact, infective, for example. And then um, the thing to bear in mind here is every state and every transition, in fact, has an integer so-called index. And this is what's called a static variable. It's, it's 
static Noteman sensor doesn't change over time. In static Noteman sensor, there's only one value for no matter how many agents there's all, are, there are, there's only one, one value of it. And so infective, like in our model, infective has one constant associated with it that denotes that state. Okay, so if I want to ask the state chart, am I in the infective state? I just give it this number. So, um, so uh, you know, we can we can use that number in various ways to ask, for example, how long have I been have I been in there? So, for example, maybe in this um, our, our chance of going out via this transition, this recovering from infection, maybe that goes up. Maybe it's not memoryless. Maybe we don't have the same chance per unit time of, of recovery over time. Maybe it defend, depends on um, on how long we've we've been in there. So we can ask infection state chart dot get local local time. Oh, okay. So um, why am I not seeing this here? So this this says uh, get local time. Um, I wonder if this is is a different version of any logic issue. Um, uh, okay, yes, no. So that's, uh, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I, it actually goes with this get local time. No, it's not. I know it says that, but uh, I don't believe it is. Um, let's, let's go check, check this out. Infection dot get, let's, let's try it. I'd be surprised. Um, well, but be the, the oh, infective. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Thank you. No, there's there's nothing because that's just a constant. Let's go look it up. Um, so it's a good thing to see. So how would I go determine this? I'd go up here, go to the help, and this should call up this, and then I can say, well, I can say get local time. Um, that's what I'd I'd look for. Get local time. And we could say go. Go see what it found. Nothing found. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Okay. Well. I'm gonna have to get back to you on this. This version of any logic must have changed that. Um, so residence time. I'm just gonna see. Um, okay. Um, so uh, residence. Oh, 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 okay. Um, uh, state chart. Let's go take a look at state chart. State chart. Um, this is all sorts of information about state charts, but. Um, what I really want to do is look at the technical information on it. Um, uh, okay, where is the state chart? Um, okay, let's, let's go there. State chart entry point, yeah. Okay, um, APR reference, there we go. Um, state chart, and there should be uh, something equivalent to get local time, I think. But uh, worst case, we could create a stock and flow that would record, uh, record it. Um, Okay, is state active? These things are still uh, maintained. Get active, single, uh, simple state. But I'm gonna have to figure out. I'm gonna have to get back to you on that because it looks like, something or or before this version. So this thing is suspect. We're gonna have to figure out how in this version it's done. Okay. Um, so those are all I have comments prepared on state charts, and we're past time now. Any any questions I can answer about these? Next time we're going to see how we do messaging. You'll notice, you'll notice people in our model um, are in a network and they can send each other messages. And you'll notice further that this infection, in addition to being a, being a timeout, you can have a message. And what that's saying is if you get a message, trigger this transition. And you can have some criteria based on it. So any questions I can answer before we go? Okay, um, that's great. So this week, there's no class on Friday. Next week, there's the class both days, but um, the vagaries of the schedule are such that uh, no, no class on Friday. Um, I know many of you are thinking about your projects, and I've been uh, talking with people about the projects. If you want to talk about yours, contact me, and I'd be glad to, to set up meetings uh, within the confines of my schedule. Okay. Uh, just a one-page uh, description of sort of what you're interested in working on, um, particularly the motivating questions. Give me some sense of the data. It's it's spec'd out. I mean, some sense of the type of data, or type of type of insights you have into that system that you could bring to bear. Um, but particularly the research question or problem that you're trying to investigate. Um, 
if you look at the syllabus, it's it's kind of mapped out there what I'd be looking for. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what the due date is. Uh, it's Friday. Is it Friday? Okay. Um, so if you can get it to me by the end of the weekend, that's also fine. Um, if you need to talk with me desperately, let me know. And if we can't something, set something up by the end of the week, we can do it by the beginning of next week for sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. And uh, I'll post these things uh, tonight. And I'll see if I can find out the equivalent. Do you recommend any kind of classic um, agent-based models about the spread of ideas? I'm looking for kind of insight-based type models. Right. Um, spread of ideas. Um, yeah, so there's uh, Josh Epstein, for example, has um, a spread of, of ideas in an infection context. Um, so uh, this was particularly.